Good morning, everyone. A very warm welcome to each and every seven or eight of you here today. It's a joy to be together and a belated Happy New Year to you all, and especially to those watching online who are very much part of the service. And I can see today that more than half our congregation are at home rather than here. And I think it's fairly clear, well, there are a few reasons. Uh, illness, bugs. I was off for a week for that. A chest infection came back today to find that people were really ill with flus and, you know, much, much uh, sicker than I was. And I think it's kind of depleted, uh, as well as the bad weather today. But I hope you're all in good spirits here today and good heart. And uh, welcome Ben and Annette. Thank you very much for coming. Uh, all the way from Bernera. You know the road very well, having driven it many a time. So welcome everybody, and I trust that to, to, today we'll just um, give our total focus and our dedication to the Lord as we begin the year, and for obscure from our, my side that uh, so many people are unable to be uh, here. But what we want as our vision is that Jesus would be the vision of this church, of our heart, of the year ahead. So we'll begin our worship by singing the well-known hymn, number 51, Be Thou My Vision.
Well, let's come before God in prayer. Almighty God, our Father in heaven, we bless you that we are called this day to worship the true and living God, that you have opened our eyes, the eyes of our understanding, to know that there is a mediator between God and man, the righteous one, Christ Jesus. Thank you, Lord, that you have established your church on that revelation, and that we here today, two millennia on, are well grounded and upon that foundation that Christ is the solid rock of our salvation. And that though many things come against us in this life, illness, bereavement, sadness, challenges, rejections, Lord, underneath us, we have that sense of reassurance that the arms of our Heavenly Father uphold us all through all the trials and tribulations of life. So for our family gathered here and those watching online, we want to immediately lay before you, Lord, the burdens of our heart. They're known to you as people have prayed and shared their, their woes and sorrows and their longings. And we do pray, Lord God, that you would draw near in the measure of comfort that they all need. Those who have lost loved ones, those who are grieving for dear friends, those who are feeling estranged and in hospital and cut off from normality, those at home today through various reasons unable to be here, those who are unemployed and feel cut off from society, those in with mental and health issues and problems, Lord, we pray for them all across our island, in the homes and the hospitals where they're cared for. We pray, Lord, that through the witness of the, the gospel online and through faithful chaplains, your word will bring comfort to many, Lord, today. Your word is not bound by the limitations of our own understanding, by the numbers attending church or by the numbers staying away. So, Lord, as it was said that the word of the Lord would go forth from Jerusalem. So let the word of the Lord go forth from Carloway and from across the pulpits of this island and find a place where people will receive glad news and comfort and reassurance that the love of God is forever theirs as they embrace the Lord and Saviour. Lord, we thank you that our last meeting was a time of celebration of the incarnation of Christ. And we pray that as a church and as individual believers, Christ will will grow within us, for he is the hope of our glory. We have no hope beyond who and what he is to us. So fill this church, Lord, with your presence in the year ahead. Truly be the vision, our hope, that we would serve Christ acceptably with fervor and zeal, that we would not diminish in our desire to see the lost saved and the church filled and replenished. Lord, this is our earnest desire. And though tiredness and weariness, fatigue, on various levels assault us. Yet this day, Lord, we make our commitment to you as Carlowe Parish Church to be faithful to God, to the gospel, to prayer, and to seeking the extension of your kingdom in the area of the island that you have given us, that you have given us to pastor and shepherd. We pray, Lord, for your peace to be among us today. For we're all a sense, Lord, from measure of disturbance and unsettledness. There are variables that we cannot control in our families and our circumstances. So, Lord, will you bring reassurance to us all this day that you are God over all, over all the affairs of mankind, over all the nations, even those in turmoil and turbulence. We know that God is at work amongst all the nations of the earth and that he has a destiny for all mankind. And, Lord, as we look at the, upon the word today, we know that that destiny is for some a dreadful destiny for those who oppose the gospel and reject the good news of Christ all the days of their life, even unto their very last breath. There is a dreadful destiny. But Lord, here today we proclaim the good news of salvation, of freedom, of peace, liberation for all mankind, for all who are watching and yet are in bondage. We pray that they would reach out this day and say, this day I will receive the mercy and forgiveness of God. I will not cast it aside, but I will embrace Christ and let him embrace me. Let him wash all my sins and wrongdoings away. Father, we pray for everyone watching who is under conviction, who is in rebellion, who is resisting the love of God as family members share the gospel with them. They say, no, that's not for me. We pray, Lord, that you break down the barriers of resistance, of human resistance, by the power of your spirit. 
The preaching of the word is God's power unto salvation. And though we are feeble in doing so, Lord, we ask that you will add what only you can add to it, to make it a word that comes with power, conviction, love, and the grace of heaven. So bless us as a congregation gathered here and at home. We remember each and every one in our hearts. Go before us now. Teach us thy ways, for we ask it in Christ's name. Amen. Psalm 34 speaks of tasting and seeing the good things of God, and I'm sure we've all tasted and many lovely things over Christmas and New Year. So we'll begin with saying Psalm 34, verses 1 to 10. God will I bless all times. Express. My soul shall boast in God, the meek shall hear with joyfulness. <laughs> truly seek the Lord shall not lack any good. Let that be your portion. I'll return to the scripture reading today from the book of Romans in chapter 1 and a few verses from chapter 2. Romans 1 and verse 18 to 25. The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. Since what may be may be known about God is plain to them, because God has made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that people are without excuse. For although they knew God, they neither glorified him as, as God, nor give thanks to him, but their thinking became futile, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like a mortal be human being, and birds and animals and reptiles. Therefore, 
God gave them over in the sinful desires of their hearts to sexual impurity for the degrading of their bodies with one another. They exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshipped and served created things rather than the Creator, who is forever praised. Amen. Chapter 2, verse 5. But because of your stubbornness and your unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath against yourself for the day of God's wrath, when his righteous judgment will be revealed. God will repay each person according to what they have done. To those who by persistence in doing good seek glory, honour and immortality, he will give eternal life. But for those who are self-seeking and who reject the truth and follow evil, there will be wrath and anger. There will be trouble and distress for every human being who does evil, first for the Jew, then for the Gentile. But glory, honour and peace for everyone who does good, first for the Jew, then for the Gentile, for God does not show favouritism. Now normally we have a hymn before the sermon, but today I'm just going to do it a little differently. I'm going to go straight into the sermon. And depending on the length of the sermon and how things go, we will sing the third hymn approximately three quarters through the sermon. <coughs> and then we'll see how the rest of the meeting goes. So today's topic is drawn from another text, text says, how shall we escape if we ignore so great a salvation? That is the theme for today. Now we're looking at, at God and the attributes of God as revealed in the book of Romans. And as we think of God's attributes, we speak in anthropomorphic terms. That is, as in human language. We speak of God, he, his attributes. And we, we would readily think of his mercy, his forgiveness, his compassion, his grace, his kindness. All the very beautiful and pos positive aspects of God, as we would speak of human characteristics. However, if we were to describe the whole range of attributes of, of ourselves as human beings, we would see that there are others maybe not so initially beautiful and positive, we would also include anger. Anger is an attribute of us as human beings. And as we see in scripture, it is an attribute, an expression of who God is. And we all, at some time or other, express anger. And as we are made in the image of God, therefore we deduce that somewhere in the character and nature of God, there is this Potential for anger. When we think of anger in ourselves, we tend to think of how we react to people or situations. Someone says or does something and it precipitates an angry response in our hearts. We get angry at their behavior. And we wonder, is it the same with God? Does God get angry at all? Is he ever angry? And if he is, what causes God to be angry? And should we be aware of his anger? And we are familiar with the phrase righteous justice or a, a wrong perpetrator on the weak and vulnerable, where something rises up within us. We feel indignation, and we say it's rightly and justifiably so. That is righteous anger. As one commentator writes, righteous anger is being angry at all the things that oppose God, unrighteousness, evil, idolatry, impurity, and sin in the world, without ourselves sinning, without being motivated by sin. As it says elsewhere in scripture, be angry, but do not sin. So that you can be angry at something and not enter into the wrong spirit of anger. Give no place to this anger. And then we find also to say that, let the sun not go down on your anger. If you have been raised to anger through the day because of something, make sure as a Christian that before you go to bed, you have been reconciled, that you have peace with God. Because we can't, we're not to carry anger in our hearts, in our thoughts as we go to bed. Now, as I've been reading through the book of Romans, which I set, set out to do, the word anger, or wrath, as it's used here, struck me from the very first chapter as we began in verse 18. And it caught my attention, but in, I suppose, in fairly typical response, I tried to brush it aside. I tried to bypass. I'd rather move on to the chapters that speak of God's forgiveness his acceptance, our adoptions as sons and daughters, the good parts. And I really don't want to 
to think about that, about the wrath. But to do that would be to engage in selective reading, just choosing the good bits. I like this where God speaks of his mercy, I, but I really don't like where, God, where it speaks of God's wrath. And for many of us growing up in Lewis, we heard a lot about the wrath of God. And so part of us ri rises up and obscures that we really don't want to think and to entertain such a thought of an angry God. It doesn't fit in somehow with our view of God and Jesus, so mild and so gentle and so gracious. But you know, is that the case always? Remember that Jesus on one occasion when he went, entered the temple where he ought to find people worshipping and hum, walking in humility and grace, he found the money changers abusing the people. And so he, it was a righteous indignation rose up within Jesus and he overturned the money changers and cast them out of the temple. So he reacted to something ungodly in righteous anger. And speaking of our fathers, did our fathers ever get angry with us? Did you as a father ever get angry with your children? Of course. If your son or daughter misbehaved, you would either give them a word of warning, a correction, a rebuke, or if it increased, you would give them, impose some punishment. Bad behavior wasn't left unattended. Anger had its cause in, your, in, in our fathers. It was precipitated by our bad behavior, which merited God, which merited our father to intervene and sometimes he would only have to clear his throat and that would be enough for some of us to <clears throat> like that. You knew that father was, you know, he was getting serious now. And there was a limit to that point where you could press in and badly behave. So if that was our father. So how much more does our heavenly father react in a sense to, to wrong behavior? Does he not get angry with his creation, which we've just read? Does he not even get angry with us, his sons and daughters, whom he loves? Is there a place for that? He certainly gets angry as he sees the world and the wickedness that's being, that's being spread by sinful, evil people, selfish, cruel desires, godless acts which bring pain and suffering to others. God is moved with compassion, but he's also moved in anger. And if we understand the, the broad picture of scripture we know that there is a day where God will deal in anger with, for all the unrighteous acts of mankind. This is a biblical view of it. God did not leave his own people Israel when they wandered into idolatry and rebellion. He didn't leave them unattended but as a jealous father he sought them. He sought them to come back and sometimes that was painful. He punished them. He put, sent them into captivity. They were defeated by, but it was all in an act of love to embrace them back into and so there's a, a tension between the mercy of God and the just judgment and the wrath of God it is to bring us back into the covenant whereby we feel reassured and yet many Christians I believe don't really have this any concept of God ha having wrath or anger that was the old see that was in the old testament when men lived under the law and it was do this and thou shalt not do that but we're under the under grace many people argue that if we argue that, then we're saying that God has changed. God has to be consistent with his character throughout the whole of Scripture. So therefore, God is still a God of mercy and grace, but also a God of wrath and anger. Now, he may not express it in the same way that we, we, we see in the Old Testament, but it's there in his nature. And that is, I, I believe, a biblical balance to the person that we worship as God. And it's, it wasn't just a one-off. We came across the word wrath twice in the, in the chapters, the verses that I read. But as we go through further in the book of Rome, it cropped up again and again. And it was plain to see, even to my resistance, that there was no getting around this. It was kind of interwoven into the text and it had to be addressed. You know, you can't just look at one aspect of the text, but see, why is there anger in God? Why is he sowing that into the text here? And so... Our attention, and I trust your attention, people at home, is being drawn to this concept. Maybe you never, ever think of God in heaven being angry. But he is. So where does that fit into your Christian understanding? I would say that the case for including the anger, anger as, as we observe God, is due to the fact that God is holy. He is a holy God. He loves that which is good and he hates that which is evil and contrary to all his goodness. 
And not only so, but God has reserved a day when he will bring a judgment on all that has been done evil, perpetrated throughout the foundations and throughout all the, 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 the millennia of millennia. God has stored up a day for all wicked acts to be receive their just punishment. Because God cannot in his nature just turn a blind eye to wrongdoing and to, to sinful ways. We might think that God has just turned a blind eye. We sometimes turn a blind eye to one another too. If someone sins, we just, I'd rather not go on and confront them. I'll just turn a blind eye. But God cannot turn a blind eye to sin. He has to, by his sin, holy nature, deal with it in some way. And there are various ways that God does that. And that day set apart is a dreadful day for all the world, for all who have ever lived, for everything, as it says here, will be brought out into the open. Every act, every thought, every wrongdoing that hasn't been covered by the blood of Christ's forgiveness. For every act that we have perpetrated that has been wrong, that we have asked God's forgiveness, as we say, it's forgotten by God. It will never, ever, ever be brought before us on the day of judgment. God will never bring your vilest sins, the wickedest, foulest things you've said and done before you again, if it's covered by the blood of his forgiveness. But if it hasn't been covered by his forgiveness, that sin in your life, will be a testimony against you come the day of judgment. As we stand before God, it will be there because it hasn't been attended to by yourself, while you, by you and I, while we were upon this life. And so it will condemn us. And the Bible goes on to speak in chapter 8. For those who are in Christ, there is no condemnation. There is nothing going to stand against us on the day of judgment. Nothing. We will be declared righteous. There will be no sins. There will be no list of things that we have done wrong. Because God has erased all that as we have received the forgiveness of Christ. And so we're preaching the gospel today and every day that people would come to that place where they, they, they won't toy around with will I or won't I. I received a, a, call, a phone call just uh, during the holiday break from someone on the mainland who watches the services every week. And I hope he's watching again today. And in a conversation, he said, will I, will I be in heaven? I said, well, there's only one way to be sure that you're going to be in heaven, and that is to commit your life to Christ. And it, you know, it's very wonderful in a sense that people out there watching in their hundreds to all the church services are going through these questions. And you might not think today this message is for you, but it's for the church, but it's also for the many who watch, who are in the, in the valley of indecision, and who, who we make the gospel appeal to. And that is as much a, a valid part of church ministry today to those online as to those here. We're trying to find the balance and address. Th th those online are more likely not to be committed to Christ and to, to be in or out. And so we make that appeal. There's no condemnation. There's nothing against people's judgments at the end. And... The, the wrath of God. Now, where does the wrath of God come in? Well, we sing it in this modern hymn. Till on that cross as Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied. For every sin was laid on him here in the death of Christ. So this is the, the theology that God's wrath is not against you, particularly against I. It's against our sin. And Jesus, having borne the sin of the world, the wrath of God was displayed against that composite sin that he, he bore. But if we receive Christ, then the, belt, the guilt and the burden of our sin is lifted off us. And you know, when, when criminals uh, appear in court for sentencing, a criminal knows, if you ever watch them, um, a criminal knows that he's guilty. He might put on his best suit. He might do something outwardly to appeal to the judge and the court. But in his heart, in her heart, they know they're guilty. And they're trying to win uh, the freedom. But when the evidence is there for all to see, there's only one verdict, and that is guilty. But not for us. All our guilt has been taken away. This is the reconciliation of the gospel. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, having been justified by faith. We stand in this grace today. Now, friends... It's the first sermon of 2023. Did you expect to come to church and hear a sermon on the wrath of God? Yes, you did. No. 
Well, we're called to preach the whole counsel of God. The whole counsel of God, the good parts and the apparently not so good parts. We'd be failing in our duty as preachers to to do so. In fact, we'd be guilty of a sin because we have to preach the whole, the whole counsel of God. There is a time, I believe, to preach such a word that the wrath of God is expressed towards mankind. Will any good come out of this sermon today? Well, let's look at another sermon that was preached with a similar title in the year 1871 by Jonathan Edwards, the great American theologian. He preached a sermon entitled, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. That was the title for today. Now imagine you're in the church hearing this, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. And he was continually being interrupted through the service. Not by people who were saying, will you shut up, Pastor? I don't want to hear about it. He was being interrupted continually by people shouting out, what must I do to be saved? They were, he- they were seeing this picture in front of them, a biblical picture of the wrath of God poured out on the last day of judgment. And they were seeing themselves unsaved and they were saying, preacher, isn't that amazing? Wouldn't it be wonderful if we heard it in your heart today, you're saying that question at home. What must I do to be saved? Well, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you and your household. And this sermon, not an appealing sermon, it might not get a rating on YouTube today. Oh, I don't want to watch the wrath of God. I think I'll tune in. This sermon was the, the, was the igniting fire for the first great awakening in America. On that day in his sermon, as he preached, hundreds came to faith, and then thousands and then hundreds of thousands. So as we preach the whole counsel of God, the love of God, the mercy, as long as, as well as judgment and the wrath, we see the whole God. And that balances that our loving Father has a, has a judgment, but he also has mercy. And so it causes us to, to flee to his mercy and to his grace. And I trust that today, even here, and those watching at home might in your heart say, what must I do to be saved? So we're going to pause now. And we're going to sing a hymn, seated, and then after that I'll come back to conclude, conclude the time very well. So we're going to sing um, number 396, Just As I Am. And this, this, is, this is a hymn that is normally used, or very often used, in a sense of people at a, at a rally coming to faith. They've heard the gospel and they're looking in their hearts and they're saying, Lord, here I am, just as I am, I come to thee. So I'm, I'm appealing to everyone here and at home to make this your prayer, number 396.
coming near to Christ in our hearts today, everyone. Now back to the title, just for a f ten minutes of further reflection. How can we escape? What are we escaping? The wrath of God. If we ignore or neglect so great a salvation. And what are the dynamics of this salvation event? Are you, are we looking for an experience, an awareness of something supernatural happening possibly? A physical encounter or something of that nature? Well, not according to scripture. One cannot find any incidences recorded where those coming to faith were said to have had such experiences apart from those on the day of Pentecost when they most certainly did have experiences. But the norm throughout scripture was not that at all. And we shouldn't make that the norm. There was no outburst of emotion, no people lying prostrate on the floor, shaking, none of that. No, the scripture tells us that the elements that were present in each and every conversion were simple. Faith and confession. Faith and confession. Romans 10, Paul sets it out very clearly in a way that we can all clearly understand. He says, if you declare with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. See, it's so straightforward. No complex theology, no focus on feelings, emotions, sensations, none of that. Although, of course, many have sensations and, and in their conversion time, but that is not the norm for everybody. So if you haven't experienced all these great sensations, don't rule yourself out. Don't rule yourself, because God's advice is, have you got faith? Have you got belief? These are the prerequisites. For what? To be saved. To be saved. And that is our purpose today. That is our purpose in preaching the gospel. We don't preach the gospel for people to become members of the church. No. We preach the gospel that people would believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved. And subsequently, if they wish, to become members of the church. So let it be. But you know, in our island culture, there are many things that have been added to salvation experience. And many are led to believe that you have to have a dramatic experience. You have to have, you know, lights and sensations. And, and if you haven't, then your faith really isn't worthwhile. It's not, you're not truly a believer. But as I've said, reading from Paul, the crucial elements are belief in the gospel promises of God. That God is faithful to fulfill them when you believe in them. You may have a feeling about it, but you have to believe. And it would be contrary to your eye to add anything to that. Oh, but I must have a, I must have a, a period of conviction of sin. Now, my grandfather, he, he, he went through six months of conviction. He wasn't. We've heard these stories from our parents. We don't have to go through a, a season of loneliness of, of, of the desert of conviction of sin, maybe some do, but you don't have to. You exclude yourself by saying, well, I, I haven't come to that. No, well, don't. Don't include yourself in that. Have you got faith? Do you believe? That's what is important, and that's what I'm asking you today. Can you say these words? If not, then I, I would say you're trapped in a lost world of your own making, not of God's making, but of your own making, a wall of unbelief surrounds you and you're not willing to step around that wall and accept what? The reality of God's word, the standard by which we make our profession known. And if you can say the words, then I might first of all say, then what's stopping you from coming and taking communion in March at, at communion? And if you don't come, if no one comes, might I be persuaded to come to the conclusion that A, my ministry here is in vain, or B, that you're not a believer really, although you attend here, person and online every week. That's a possible deduction if you're not willing and able to make a profession. If you cannot take your stand for Christ once in your life, then you may convey from your inaction that you do not believe. 
These are two options, but there's, there's another option I'm presenting today. C, an alternative. Has something been added to the equation which is preventing people from professing their faith? I believe there is, and today we're going to do something different, quite radical maybe. But as what I read from the scripture, only profession of faith was required, not coming to the Lord's table. There's nowhere in scripture that it's, you have to confess and come to the Lord's table to become a member. The church at, in the first century, it was a requirement. People were, just couldn't come into the church. They had to go through a, a season of catechizing and instruction, and then they were allowed. But we're not living in the first century. Now we, in our culture and Presbyterianism, have added that you cannot really be a believer unless you come to the Lord's table. And by deduction, if you don't come to the Lord's table, then you're not a believer. Now, I think that's erroneous. I think there's a falsehood in there. It's a non, it's a non biblical statement to make. So today, I'm going to make a biblical statement and ask it directly to your heart. I'm going to pass around, well, Douglas says, a slip of paper with three questions in it. And next to it will be a yes or a no. And I'm requesting that, an, uh, and that, you, that a pen will be passed around. It'll be on the screen too, so you know what's coming your way. Thanks, Douglas. If everyone... It, it, I put them beside you in the room. Pen and a paper. On the three questions, maybe you can't read, but you'll see it on the little slip. Box A. I believe in my heart that Jesus Christ is Lord. Beside it, there's a yes and a no. In the next box, I believe that God raised Jesus from the dead. Again, a yes or a no. And then thirdly, I am a believer. Yes or no. So please, I would like everyone to put your name on the top. Really would like you to put your name and to circle each one. If you can't circle, you can write A for abstain. If you're not sure if you are a believer, and I think there is a place for that. We must give people, allow them to say, but what you're doing is you're agreeing with scripture. I believe in my heart that Jesus is Lord and that God raised him. That's all you're asking to do. Circle it, fold it over, and then leave it on the seat when you leave. Today I won't be meeting at the door. I think because of all the viruses and flus, we won't be interacting at the door. So please everyone, fill in the, fill in the form. And I would like people at home, those of the church in Carloway here, if you're here, we have a, num a good number of, ad ad of adherents. And you're not here today. If you're here next week, maybe I will give you the same form. Because, I'd you know, it's like, I'll be quiet for a minute. While you're filling in the form. Just your name, circle A. Is this a right thing to do? Now I know some of you are or were teachers. And if you were a teacher, you would want to know that your pupils, your students were going to pass the exam, that they knew the answers to the questions. So you would probably devise for them in class by their answers that's good, my pupils know they're going to pass, I am confident and as the pastor of this church that's exactly what I'm doing I'm asking every person adherent to write their name and their spiritual allegiance to Christ yes or no no coercion to come to the table now or until March Thank you, everybody, for your faithfulness and your attention to this. It's, it's important that we begin the year together, walking together in Christ. Thank you very much. Thank you, Douglas. I better fill in one, too, just to make sure. <laughs> so I'll, I'll fill it in. Don't be like
Thank you. Well, we're ready. We're ready. We've completed our day, and thank you for everyone for attending. The weather is east of five. Wish you a blessed rest of the day, and we'll hopefully see you uh, next week. So we're going to conclude by singing. Uh, in a sense, we're professing our faith in what we've seen. I am trusting the Lord Jesus, trusting only in number 258. So we'll conclude with this. and pass of righteousness and peace and health and goodness. May your mercy be upon each and every one of this congregation, the young, the old, everyone who's watching, Lord. We pray your blessing upon the family of God, the riches through Christ Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen.